Time for our midweek Bible class to continue. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the second half of the chapter, verses 13 through 18. Probably the part of 1 Thessalonians that 1 Thessalonians is known for. If you, if anything you read in this book sounds familiar, it'll be something from these verses that'll say, oh, I've, I've heard a sermon on that somewhere, or I read it once. Uh, that, or maybe the first part of chapter 5. Uh, the rest of it usually gets skipped over a lot. Um, this is the part where we get to fight about end time stuff, so it's always exciting to people. Um, before we dive in, um, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and the blessings of it, and we thank you for your word and the scriptures which guide our lives and give us hope. Be with us this evening and help us to understand your word with a discerning mind. Thanks you pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How much in a, let's, let's pick a random amount of time, in a week, how much in a given average week do you think about or contemplate the second coming of Christ? A lot lately. A lot lately. It is kind of interesting how, like, events make you think, oh, maybe, maybe this is it, you know. But Russian invasions notwithstanding and other things, on an average week, what, what would you think through most of your life? It's interesting. I... I don't know if there's a right answer to that question, which is probably why you're not willing to give me an answer, because you might give the wrong one, right? Uh, but I don't know that we think about it a whole lot compared especially to how much this church in Thessalonica seemed to. And maybe, maybe all churches in the first century did. They were very, very interested in the return of Christ as a real and certain hope. Um, and, and until we appreciate how real and pressing that concern was for them, it'll be hard to appreciate what this text is about. These are people who are, for them, in times discussion was not some kind of hypothetical that you might want to get right. It was absolute and urgent in their concern. So a significant portion then of the end of this epistle, end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, and then at least half of chapter 2 in the next epistle both address this topic in various ways. Uh, we'll start with verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. So what was the specific concern that they had that he wants to address according to verse 13. Those that had died, they wondered about it. They didn't have any kind of certainty in their faith, which is understandable. Remember we talked about these are essentially all new converts. On the, in the grand scheme of things, if I'm listing Bible doctrines and their significance, while I would never want to diminish the significance of the return of Christ, when I'm talking to a new convert, it's probably not my leadoff hitter. You know, it's not the one that I say, let's, let's start with eschatology and uh, let's talk about differing views about the millennium or something. You know, it, we, just not where we go right away with new converts because it's something that even really mature Christians struggle with, admit ignorance about, fight about, so forth. So while I'm sure Paul taught them something, that's going to become very evident in the following verses. They already knew something. They didn't feel like they had a lot of certainty, and he didn't want them to be uninformed about people who had already died. What was their current reaction to people who had died? Yeah, grief. They were struggling with a great deal of grief tied to their uncertainty. So let's look at this just a minute. Um, Probably this is not new information, but information given a new or greater significance. I don't think Paul says anything in chapter 4 
that's not taught somewhere else in the New Testament. I just think he, exp- he uses more words, that he's just trying to clarify something for them that they already had some knowledge of but wanted more. Um, when he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, seems to mean I would not have you to be ignorant of what the resurrection means and what it entails. Probably the Christians at Thessalonica had asked about this topic either through a letter or when they sent Timothy back or both. Maybe they sent Timothy back with a letter (laughs) that said, hey, we are confused about this and we want to know more. And so here after doing all his three chapters of personal stuff and then half a chapter of Christian ethics, he says, now I really do want to address this concern that you seem to have. Um, Same structure, incidentally, when you read 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, there's some personal stuff. There's a whole bunch of doctrinal stuff in the middle. And then in chapter 15, he says, now let me get to the most important thing. (laughs) Out of 16 chapters, in chapter 15, he says, now let me talk about the resurrection of the dead. uh, And puts that towards the end. Those who are asleep seems to be a pretty common term for Paul uh, for someone who had died. Uh, It seems to be a Jewish metaphor or idiom describing the the apparent state of the body. I think most of us have seen a person who has passed and looked at them and said, it just looks like they're, yeah, just looks like they're sleeping. The body, especially the first several days, maintains all of its normal character, you know, just on a quick, casual glance, but isn't moving, isn't animated. So I think it was very easy then. We also like euphemisms because we don't like to say dead, okay? I just used one. Did you catch that? Someone who has passed, right? Because even even saying dead, you know, just, oh, I don't like saying the word, okay? So we like euphemisms. Apparently Paul does too. And so if you look in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, 11, 30, 15, 6, 18, 20, 31, and then three times in this section, he'll use sleep as kind of a a favorite expression for death. Jesus does this on occasion as well, um, sometimes to great ridicule and consternation, uh, that he'll say, oh, he's not dead, he's asleep. And I say, well, we, we know what dead is, by which he means I'm about to wake them up. Uh, resurrection's coming. And that may be another important element of it. Sleep is something you recover from, right? Death, it sounds permanent. So when Paul thinks about death, to him, he thinks of it as sleep. It's something that one day you will wake from. Sleep is a very pleasant metaphor. I like sleeping, right? I have kids, so... I haven't slept well since 2009, right? You, you, it just changes, right? And sleep is a good thing. Death is a bad thing. Paul says, let's talk about sleep. So I think it's a kind way of speaking of it. Um, in this text, he's going to talk about Christians who had died specifically. Um, so in verse 13, it's you, and then there's those others, In verse 16, it's the dead in Christ. So that's not to say that there's nothing to be known about someone who dies and is not in Christ. It's just not the topic here. Okay, You're going to have to look elsewhere for that kind of information. So far, so good on those who are asleep. I'll say I don't think it says anything about the state of a dead person and their awareness or lack thereof. There have been a few through the years who have tried to say that this means that when you die, you're in a uh, non-conscious type state indefinitely. Um, I don't know how you'd prove that one way or the other, but that's not what this means. It, it doesn't seem to be descriptive of that. And to the contrary, on occasion in the Bible, you see people who have died being depicted as kind of animated and speaking and having conversations and so forth. So uh, I think that's probably the opposite of the case. Um, the instruction, the concern is that you may not grieve as others who do not, uh, who have, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. So the Thessalonians seem to be grieving because of a misunderstanding of this topic. Thus they ended up grieving 
as others do who have no hope. I feel like that gets misunderstood a lot. It's not suggesting that Christians are told never to grieve. That's not what it says. In fact, if you want a little bit of a, a been been the preacher pet peeve for a minute, um, I get aggravated when people, how do we want to say it? get a little too carried away making funerals pleasant. How about that? Well, they say, well, it just ought to be a celebration. It ought to be, well, okay, but somebody did die. I mean, it's, it's okay to grieve. No one should feel ashamed of shedding tears at a funeral. It's appropriate. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4, you might remember this bit about there's a time for everything, a season for everything under heaven. There's a time to laugh and a time to weep, a time to sing, a time to mourn, and so forth. There are appropriate times for tears and mourning. Anybody remember the shortest verse in the Bible, in your New Testament? Jesus wept, right? And what was the occasion of it? A friend had died. A friend who he was quite certain he was about to raise from the dead. He's still sad. Someone died. Death is sad. So I I do not think for a second that this means Christians are not entitled to some kind of grief. What it says is, don't grieve as others who have no hope. When a pagan grieves the loss of a loved one, in in Greek thought, when you're dead, you go off into the other side, and there is no coming back, and the other side is boring and sad. Okay, You're just this wispy little ghost creature over there in Hades, somewhere in that realm, and there's just nothing more to the story. So when you die... That, I mean, it, it's absolutely tragic and irreversible. So if you lose someone in that sense, you're not just grieving, you're inconsolable. And so I think Paul says, well, we don't have to grieve like them. Doesn't mean we don't grieve. Christians grieve Christianly. We, we grieve as Christians grieve. We grieve with you know, a little sprinkle of hope mixed in that makes it actually quite bearable. And at some point, we even sometimes find peace in that process of grief. But we still go through it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we miss them for now. And that's an appropriate grief. Okay. If, if I'm going to be parted from somebody I love for a year... I mean, if they just went across the country for a year, I'd be sad just to be separated that long. Well, death, you know, should be at least that sad because I'm separated from somebody I love and I don't know when I get to see him again, even though I quite certainly believe that I will. So there is an appropriate grief. It's just not a hopeless grief. And that seems to be what he's suggesting. You don't have to be inconsolable. There is a way to think of it differently. There's a lot of things that Christians believe. You know, a Greek person dies, they weren't in a better place. The, pl- the place where a Greek person thought they went was lousy. You didn't want to go there. Christians think of it as something good, in, in a sense. It's very different. We think better place. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep Um, since we believe just nerd moment with me for a moment uh, in Greek grammar you can express conditional sentences in different ways you can say uh, if this is the case and it's not if this is the case and it might be if this is the case and it really is this is the last one (laughs) this is if it is the case that we believe, and we do, and so the, the ESV just translates it, since we believe, right? if it is the case, and it absolutely is, 
that we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Right? So that's, that's the linchpin. Everything else he's going to say now hinges on that conviction. If we're not sure of that, don't bother with the rest of the conversation. So in the longer version of this, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's a 58-verse chapter about the resurrection. And the first half, nearly, is on, is Jesus raised from the dead, and what does that mean? And then you get all the way to the end, and he says, now, based on that, I can tell you about your resurrection. But Jesus, in his resurrection, is the bedrock. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, we're of all men most miserable. Like, if that's not true, all bets are off. What are we doing here? That one had better be true. So the fact of Jesus' bodily, factual resurrection is not under question. It's the groundwork upon which every Christian hope is built. Um, in fact, he even goes so far as to say that is of first importance. Here's that section in 1 Corinthians. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Oh, look, there's that phrase again. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, most of, or last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So not only is it true, Paul has committed the witness list to memory. It was something that he could just rattle off and say, let me, I can name the people who saw him, in case you're not sure. And he considered himself the last of those. But the key phrase is, this is of first importance. Everything that follows starts with that. Why? Because through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Okay. This, this is a little bit of a weird concept for us because of the 2,000 years that have spanned from then to now. But in New Testament thought, the resurrection began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the first body is out of the ground. So what makes that weird is now it's been 2,000 years and we're waiting on the second one, right? So that's, that's a little odd for us. But for them, they thought of it as the resurrection is begun, the first body is out of the tomb. That, that was significant. So because Jesus is raised, the resurrection's on. Now we'll just wait till God comes for the rest of us. Um, our resurrection then is the completion of what began in Jesus. If Jesus is raised, then all those in Jesus will be raised. So the way the New Testament talks about this is saying things like, if the resurrection is a birth, then we can call Jesus the firstborn. If the resurrection is a harvest, then Jesus is the first fruits. And look at a couple of verses here. Here's Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Right? Many will be born from the dead. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead which is, if you get into Colossians a little bit, in the previous verse or two, he had said he's the firstborn of all creation. So he's firstborn in the sense that he ranks higher than Adam. Right? Nobody outranks Jesus. But then in this other sense, he's also the firstborn from the dead. He is the first of the resurrection. He's the beginning of the resurrection. He rose to die no more. Because he died no more. Yeah, there are, there, are people, there are people that Jesus himself raised, right? What happened to every one of those people? They died. So we might think of theirs. Um, theirs was like an armistice with death, right? But not a victory. That they, in uh, Ukraine, they're fighting for a, a ceasefire. It's not the same as the end. That's the end for now. And I think everybody who is raised from the dead in your Bible other than Jesus, is a for now kind of resurrection. In fact, I've gotten in the habit when I, when I write a sentence with the word resurrection in it, if I refer to anybody else, I write resurrection with a lowercase r, but when I refer to Jesus, I use a big uppercase r just to remind myself that he's like in a whole different class 
because when they talk about him, they don't just say, hey, he, he raised again, and that was nice. P Peter will say things in Acts 2 like, he conquered death. It was not possible for death to hold him, right? He actually defeated something. When Jesus comes out of the tomb, he is different than the man who went in. Lazarus comes out, he's still wrapped in, they have to like untie him, right? He's not really doing so great. Jesus comes out and he's downright mysterious, right? He's glorified and magnified and it's, it's a whole other thing. People start bowing down and worshiping him when they see him. People didn't worship Lazarus, why not? He was lower R <laughs> resurrected. Jesus is capital R resurrected. I think, I think that's the difference. Um, First Corinthians, same kind of language. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, lots of people are dead waiting for the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruit of the harvest, right? The first grain pulled into the barn. Verse 15, back in 1 Thessalonians, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Anybody grow up with the King James Bible? Was that just me? What, what word was here in the King James Bible? Prevent, yes. In old King James English, we will not prevent those who have fallen asleep. And if you were a 12-year-old reading that, you thought, What? <laughs> And then you read your footnote and it said, proceed. Oh, okay, Old English, how fun. Yeah, prevent, proceed those who have fallen asleep. Um, lots to discuss in this verse. Before I dive in though, I actually wanna talk about this little phrase. This we declare to you by a word from the Lord. What does that mean? Was the rest of it stuff Paul had made up and now he's finally, oh, and by the way, this is something God said. It's a trick question. That's not the right answer, in case you're, you're unclear. Okay. Um, I'm of the opinion, it's a pretty minor and unimportant opinion, but it's mine, so I'll share it, that this is one of the phrases Paul is likely to use when he's either quoting or paraphrasing Jesus himself. So, for example, Paul's quotations of Jesus, an excursion beyond the Thessalonian letters. How about some slides? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, he's talking about the subject of marriage and divorce. And in verse 10, he says, To the marriage I, married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. So here he says, I'm going to tell you something now that you could have read if you read things Jesus said. Jesus taught on divorce in all the gospel accounts. They weren't written at this time. But had they been, you could have read in Luke or in Matthew or Mark and read what Jesus said. And what did he say? The wife should not separate from her husband. Okay, pretty straightforward. That's the sort of thing Jesus taught. Then two verses later, he says, to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. And then he examines a very specific case that has to do with an unbelieving spouse or a believing spouse. And then a big complicated mess of a chapter follows that I'm not going to cover. But what does he mean when he says before, this is the Lord, not me. But then he gets to verse 12. Now, this is I, not the Lord. Uh, there, I don't know if it's the NIV or one of the other translations that actually takes this and says, uh, now to the rest, I'll give you my opinion, which is like the least Paul thing you'll ever hear. I mean, I, I can't imagine Paul saying, the rest of this is made up. Don't worry about it. I'm going to talk a while. Everything Paul said was by the Spirit of God, but not everything was a quotation from Jesus. Jesus had taught on the subject of divorce. He says, you know, this isn't new doctrine. If you've ever heard Christ teach on divorce, you've heard the following, divorce bad. Jesus taught that. Did Jesus ever talk about the very specific question they had in Corinth? No. He says, so now, even though Jesus never talked about this, I will. So Paul will sometimes identify in his teachings, here's something Jesus has already said. What do they say on the reading rainbow? But don't take my word for it. Right? And then you introduce your source. Okay. Some of you got that, and some of you didn't. That's okay. Some of you are good, and some of you are bad. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay. 
that's kind of an odd statement, but it's actually something that Jesus taught in one of his teachings in Luke. He makes a reference to the laborer is worthy of his hire. Um, Paul references that again in 1 Timothy 5.18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. That, I think, is Deuteronomy. And the laborer deserves his wages. That's not in the Old Testament. <laughs> but he quotes it as scripture. That is a quotation from Jesus, I think, in Luke. So Paul will sometimes quote Jesus, sometimes verbatim, sometimes as a paraphrase, the same way he would Moses. You know, and here's what scripture says. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11:23 talking about communion for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread right and then he repeats for the next several verses the story of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper almost verbatim the way it is in Luke's gospel Paul where'd you get that teaching on the communion it's what Jesus said this isn't anything new this is what Jesus said Acts 20 and verse 35 he's talking to the elders from Ephesus in all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Funny about that one. He quotes Jesus. That phrase is not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That it was a, something that Jesus had taught that no gospel author had ever written down, but people remembered. Remember that time Jesus said that? Oh, yeah, I remember that. And so Paul could reference it, okay, an oral teaching of Jesus. So I say all that to say, when Paul uses phrases like this, here's a word from the Lord, or this is what the Lord said, uh, it quite often highlights a quotation or paraphrase of Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 7.10 is a paraphrase of Jesus on marriage. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.14, paraphrase of Luke 10 or Matthew 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 is a lengthy quotation of Christ. Acts 20 is quoting Jesus, not even from a gospel, just from something people had heard. So when he says this one, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, it leads me to think he's trying to reassure them, this is not something even new that I'm explaining for the first time. If you listen to Jesus teach, Jesus taught that what? He would come again and the dead would be raised. Those were part of the teachings of Jesus. It's not something that Paul says, ah, oh, now let me tell you the things Jesus never got to. Right? There is some of that in the New Testament, where Paul says, Jesus never got to this, the Spirit's telling me to write it. But in this case, he says, no, this, this is actually, in a sense, rudimentary Christian doctrine. These are the teachings of Christ. There is going to be a resurrection. He is going to come again. So we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. This is the kind of thing that Jesus taught. Now, what's he quoting directly? Couldn't tell you. It's not a verbatim quote from any verse I know. Um, could be a paraphrase of something out of Matthew 24. Um, could be general teaching of John 5, 28 to 29. Or it could be another one of those things like Acts 20 where he says, everybody knows Jesus said this. It's not written down anywhere, but everybody knows Jesus said this stuff. But it's, the basic idea is, this is not something new. Because that's always, it's always a little suspect, right? When you have a hard question, and then your teacher says, ah, oh, well, I haven't got to this part yet. And he tells you something completely different. You say, that's not what you said yesterday. Paul says, let me reassure you by telling you the same sort of thing Jesus taught when he was around here. Well, not in Thessalonica, but when he was on earth. He taught that there would be a resurrection. He taught that the dead were not the losers in this battle. That was something that was important that Jesus taught. The big point seems to be that some thought the return of Jesus would truly only benefit the living. Back to our initial question beginning of class, how often do you think about the second coming of Christ? In their mind, it seemed to be they thought it was going to happen. They thought about it a lot. It would probably happen fairly soon. And to them, it was more real than even the resurrection. Yeah. 
and that's what makes it tough for us. The intervening years, we say, well, I mean, if it was tough for them, it's really tough for us. Right? But their concern seems to be that what if I die before Jesus comes back? Does that mean that I missed the victory of Jesus over the persecutors of the church, for example? Is it something that only pertains to the living? And then someday down the road, there will be a resurrection, I suppose. And they weren't denying a resurrection. They just thought that the coming of Christ and the resurrection might be very different things. And boy, wouldn't it stink to be faithful all your life, wait for the coming of Christ, and then you die, and all the good stuff happens while you're in the grave, and then somewhere down the road there's a resurrection, and Jesus says, oh, yeah, we did all that. That would be very disappointing. So you can see their concern over them that sleep. Like, did, they, did they miss out on all the good stuff? You had me right up to the last sentence when the dead were still living. Hang on. Do it again now. You, you, I was with you up until the dead that are still living bit. What was that last bit? Yes. Do you think both the living and the dead in that verse are people that have died? I think probably the ones that are living are living and the ones that are dead are dead. But I might, I might disagree with you on that one. I think what he's saying is some of us, and he probably included himself in that, just because you would. I mean, it would be weird for Paul to say, and those of you like me that will be dead by then, you wouldn't say that. You'd say, those of us that are alive, why would you say it that way? Because Paul's currently alive. We don't get something better than the ones that have died. In fact, we don't even go before them. They, they come first. They're not getting a second-tier celebration. They're the first guest at the party. And we that are alive, and Paul thought that he might be one of them. Okay. Now, to be careful, in the very next chapter, in chapter 5, Paul clarifies I have no idea when Jesus is coming back. Like, as a matter of doctrine, he says, I have no idea. But for the sake of argument, if I'm alive when that happens, I'm not going to beat the other guys to victory. It seems to be the point he's making. Um, the living and the dead would be there at the same event. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So again, who's, who's rising first? The dead. Okay. Um, the Lord himself will descend. And the important point is he's combining Christ returns and the resurrection. Same thing. I think, again, the Thessalonians thought one might be distant someday, whatever, but Jesus is going to be here on Thursday. I mean, that's happening any day now. And Paul's saying, whenever they happen, they happen together. And the dead are not going to miss it, promise. The dead will not miss it. Uh, the elements are connected. Jesus himself will be present at this event, which is appropriate because he's the first one resurrected, right? And then there's three sounds that are military sounds that describe the, the event. How do you know it's happening? There's three sounds, and it's possible they're the same sound for what it's worth, and I'll point that out in a second. But there is uh, a cry of command. Some translations will have shout. Uh, there's the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Um, Ben's personal opinion is that it's the same thing. It's an archangel issuing a command, 
and it sounds like a trumpet because he's really loud. I think it's the same. I don't think there's like a succession of noises. Now here's number one, and then here's number two, and then here's number three, I think. In the same way in Revelation, it'll talk about the singing of the saints like the thunder and the voice of many waters and the, you know, it's like, it's loud. That's the idea. And I think that's what he's saying. When this happens, there's going to be, first of all, he describes it as a cry of command. Um, it's literally a shouted order. So it's not just a noise, ah, right? Just someone making noise down the hall. It is a command as in like charge or go get them or start the battle. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a command, military issue. The words used as a verb in the New Testament in Greek like 28, 29 times, always translated as order or command. Someone issued an order. So the first thing is it describes it as an order, like a general has arrived and here comes the order. And who gives the order? Specifically, the voice of the archangel is perhaps issuing his commander's command. So this is a military language. Heaven opens up, heaven's host arrives, Jesus is with them, and his lieutenant is out in front saying, all right, boys, here we go. And he shouts a command. Uh, if you read Daniel 12, verses 1 through 4, which is possibly the only clear resurrection text in the Old Testament, with maybe one other exception, it also mentions that an angel leads the way for the resurrection. So let me just read that. Um, this is Daniel 10, 20 and 21, an earlier passage. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I, got out, when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. I don't know what that's all about. It's weird. But the point is, but I will tell you what is described in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against thee except Michael, your prince. Whoever speaking says, when I'm fighting against evil, my right-hand man is Michael, prince of angels. And then in chapter 12, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Probably the clearest resurrection passage in the entire Old Testament. There's a day coming. It's going to be a battle. First thing you're going to hear, Michael's out front. Archangel's out front, shouting his command. And that's how you know it's time for the bodies to get up out of the ground. Okay. So Paul seems to just connect that language and says, yep, that's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear a, somebody shouting a command. You're going to hear the voice of the archangel. And then the trumpet of God, which in uh, prophetic language in the Old Testament is always what you hear when God shows up. Okay. Um, you guys have seen a cartoon at some point when, when, or a movie, right? When the, when the king enters the throne room, somebody blows a trumpet and everybody stands up, right? That's the imagery here. That there's this angel, he shows up, he's shouting orders, and there's this sound. It's either his voice sounding like a trumpet or somebody's literally blowing a trumpet. I don't know. The important part, it's a trumpet, not a French horn, not a clarinet, none of those other inferior instruments. It is a trumpet that God himself uses, as do all good Christians. The trumpet of God signified the arrival of God in judgment, and they're also used to announce calamity in the book of Revelation. Let me give you a few examples. This is Isaiah 27, 13. And in that day a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out of the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Trumpet, God shows up. Go back. Joel 2, verse 1 and also verse 15. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Again, God shows up, somebody better blow a trumpet. Zechariah 9, 14. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. 
the Lord will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. So again, marching military language, God shows up, there's a trumpet. Okay? So that's just the, the imagery of the battle has commenced, God has arrived, watch out. So all these sounds paint one important picture. Jesus is coming as a conqueror. Going back again, what is the meaning of Jesus' resurrection? Not merely that he escaped death, that he defeated death. And now he's coming for the rest of us, and death will not survive. Everybody who has died, see, now the resurrection in full commences. Our conquering hero has arrived, and he's issuing commands, right? He's not beaten. He hasn't been retreating. He's been waiting for the charge. The dead will not miss out on the victory of Jesus. In fact, they are the first people that will respond to his order. He gives the order, they get up. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Okay. So yes, we're invited too, but the dead will not miss out on anything. We'll all be there together with Christ um, what's this medium in the clouds business? Um, I th still think you're supposed to keep it in military terms. And the ancient person would have caught this. We don't, because we don't have a lot of military imagery in our culture. But um, when Caesar would go on an extended campaign to the Gauls and conquer some you know, people over here, he'd come back home to Rome, and the citizens would all rush outside, and they'd, they'd meet him outside the city, and he'd come in and they'd have a parade. And you welcomed home the conquering general. So N.T. Wright describes it. There is the language well known in the pagan world of an emperor or other dignitary making a state visit to a city or province, or even when the emperor had been elsewhere, his return to Rome. And this idea of he's going to show up, he's majestic, he's glorious, he's already conquered everything, and we're going to rush out to meet him. And so the parade commences. And I think that's the imagery here. We're not even going to wait for him to get here. We're going to meet him in the air. Like we're rushing out to celebrate with him. We're going to be with him. And then we'll never be separated from him again. Wherever he goes, we go. Yeah, there's even language of we're more than conquerors. Like maybe, maybe you've been in a Roman parade and you've met a conqueror. Christ and his followers are more than conquerors. This is even better than that, right? N.T. Wright goes on to say, in fact, the Greek word parousia, uh, which means coming, uh, is drawn not from the Bible at all, but from the world of pagan usage, where it was almost always a technical term for this kind of imperial visitation. The point here is that the meeting refers to a meeting outside the city after which the civic leaders escort the dignitary back into the city itself. Right? We're just excited to see him. We rush out there. We learn how to fly. We're so excited. We jump into the air and go find Jesus, and he comes back with us, right? And he takes us wherever he's going. So it's, it's parade language, victory language. I suppose so. Now, that's one that Paul's not going to discuss here. In the 1 Corinthians 15, he, he spends verse after verse about, well, the body will be like this, or it'll be like that, it'll be like a star, but more like the sun, and it'll be like, and he does this whole thing. Here he's like, you're going to be with Jesus, don't worry about it. Like, he doesn't even address that topic at all. You'll be with Jesus. No, I, no I'm not saying you are. I mean, it's like, it's the way he, he refers to it is if, like, that's even a secondary concern. As if to say, you're going to be staring at Jesus, and you're not going to care what you look like. And that's the way this passage floats through. That There's this parade, and everyone's focused on this, this man with the angel and the trumpet and the shouts and the whole business. So we will always be with the Lord, where Jesus is honor guard, made up of his saints, both living and dead. Um, which ones? All of us. At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints was the previous chapter. No one's getting left out or forgotten in this moment of victory. Hence, the final verse of the chapter, therefore encourage one another with these words. 
how do we start the book of 1 Thessalonians? Suffering, persecution, death, awfulness, and worse, while they were suffering and dying, some of them were worried that the dead missed out. Paul says, it's okay. You can encourage, encourage one another with these words. Jesus wins. The resurrection is coming with him. No one's going to miss out. It's going to be okay. In a, in a war-torn region or in the middle of persecution, they didn't think about that once or twice a week. They thought that by the minute. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> get that resurrected body. Uh, so one last point then for us, just to clarify something that sometimes Christians miss when we talk about it. The belief in the resurrection is not just a belief that the dead still live now. So again, I'll quote my favorite commentator. Anti Wright says, resurrection is something new, something the dead do not presently enjoy. It'd be life after life after death. <laughs> right? That is, as if to say, all right, Abraham is somewhere right now. But then even something better is coming, right? That there is this bringing up of the body. And so I don't know what shape Abraham's in right now. Maybe he's Casper or he's a little wispy ball of light somewhere. I have no idea, right? But in the resurrection, the body glorified like Christ himself comes up out of the ground. And that's this complete and total victory. Death or is thy sting? Nothing. Yeah, like he's he's in a state of some kind of exaltation that's just hard to communicate in that passage. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And still waiting for something better in the resurrection. I mean, he's there, he's comforted, he's at peace, and even in that state, he's waiting for the resurrection, which is better. And that's kind of astounding that that's something new. With uh, the five or so minutes remaining, now for something completely different, um, I have a, a strange tradition on uh, this particular Wednesday of the year. In the Churches of Christ, we don't do a lot of Lent or Ash Wednesday stuff. And I didn't even bring any ash to fling at you, so you're okay. You're going you're gonna to leave here clean. But my habit has been for several years on uh, the first day of Lent. Lent is supposed to be a time of repentance. It kind of gets trivialized, which is why we don't take it very seriously, of like it's 40 days to give up chocolate or something. But back in the long ago when Lent was a thing, it was about recognizing your own sin, fasting, and prayer, as a lead up to the story of the cross on Easter later in the spring. So it was a time to be thoughtful. And the traditional passage to read on that occasion is Psalm 51. So with our final five minutes, if you'll indulge me, I would just like to share with you a reading of Psalm 51 and kick off the time of penance, consideration, and introspection. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice where I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is God's word. All right, go repent.